given Brother Rex the baptismal certificate. A man gave uh, John Thomas his Wednesday, and uh, I'm looking forward to what God's going to be doing. Uh, prayerfully, hopefully, and uh, we're really putting our finger on it. Uh, the week of the 11th, which is uh, next week, um, we're, that, we're praying that our baptismal tank will come in, and then uh, all the brethren that I've already spoke to, uh, and even if I have not yet, uh, if you want to get involved, you just come to me and let me know. But uh, when it comes, hopefully it'll come on Monday. That's my plan. That's what I'm shooting for. Come on Monday, we'll just have to unload it off the truck and then get it in the church, and then we'll have that week to uh, custom fit it. To, uh, to this area here and get the new baptismal tank in. And then, the only thing we need to do is bring some more folks to get baptized in Jesus' name. So, uh, I'm not saying you really have to advertise it like that, but it, will, it might be nice. You know. Tell somebody, you know, if you're the first to get baptized, you'll win $100. You won't do that. You won't do that. We don't want to pay people to get baptized, that's for sure. No. Hey, listen, if we pay people to get baptized, we, we couldn't handle it. I'm telling you, we couldn't get baptized left and right. All right, so we're in the middle of a great, uh, I believe, a great quarter talking about marriage and family. And last week, uh, I talked about parents being trainers and restrainers. Uh, parents that train their children in the way that they should go. And then parents that are restrainers, which, you know, teach them the right way and keep them from harm, that sort of thing. Um, last week, you know, if you did not have a child in your home, if your children were already grown and moved on, uh, you know, you, you probably, I hope you enjoyed it, but it didn't really, you know, uh, apply because you've already been through that stage of your, of your life. However, today, this lesson is for everybody. Every parent that has a child, every grandparent, every aunt, uncle, anybody, uh, will say, that's ever, uh, you know, if you have, let me put you like this, if you have a child or a teenager uh, or even a full-grown adult, a child of yours that is a full-grown adult even today, you can still participate in what I'm about to teach you about. We're going to be talking about parents as encouragers. Now, let me tell you right off the bat that as I studied this lesson, I was heavily, heavily, heavily convicted. <laughs> As I did. In fact, uh, you know, a lot of times when preachers study to preach or teach anything, uh, at least let me say for me, I try to make it come here first and preach to myself. That way, when I'm preaching or teaching to you, I'm not doing it as if I'm up here and you're down here. As I'm, you know, telling you what. No, this is for everybody. What I preach, if I were sitting out there, this is what I would want preached to me. If I'm sitting out there, this is what I would want taught to me. So as I go through this lesson, you'll you'll see. Um, I think one of the hardest things that a parent, one of the hardest things that a parent has to do as a parent all their life is to be an encourager. You might think, Brother Roy, that's strange. How, how is that the hardest thing to do is to be an encourager? All you've got to do is speak positive words and lift somebody up. Has anybody here ever felt, let me, let me back, anybody here ever not really felt like doing that? Because there's times in parenting, there's times in marriages, there's times in relationships with friends that things happen, and it's real hard to speak a word of encouragement. When what you want to do is speak a different kind of word. <laughs> you might know what I'm talking about. So, and we'll get into that. But let, let's look at our lesson text. Genesis chapter 37 and verse number 1. All those that are here this week, if you were not here last week, we missed you. Uh, we're glad that you're here. And uh, we pray for you. We're going to keep praying for you. Amen. We're glad you're here today. Genesis chapter 37, beginning with verse number 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more, everybody say more, more. than all children. Now, I know when you read that, we all, we 
always teach and preach and practice. You, you shouldn't love one child more than the other. Right. Okay? That's, that, that's not really what this scripture is saying here. I know it may appear that way, but he loved them all. But there was something special about Joseph. And if you know the story of Joseph, you know what happens later, okay? That there was a special kind of love that was towards him. He loved all of his children, but more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. So there was something significant about it. It wasn't that he was a bad person, that Israel was a bad person. Uh, it wasn't, it had nothing to do with that. It was the fact that there was something special that was going to happen. As we look to Genesis chapter 50 and verse 18, Genesis 50 and verse 18, and his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. Now remember, his brethren, Joseph's brothers, are the ones that cast him down in a well. I mean, you talk about, you know, brothers and sisters not getting along. You talk about sibling rivalry. This is of the worst kind. They were, they hated him. They wanted him gone. They didn't, you know, he came to him when he was a little kid and basically said, look, I had a dream and my dream is this. All my brothers and sisters in my family, yeah, they're going to bow down to me. And they're going to serve, they're going to be servants. I mean, now, as a young child coming and telling older siblings that, yeah, that didn't go over very well. Okay? So, he was simply stating what he felt in a dream. He wasn't trying to be haughty about it. He was saying, this is what I had a dream, and this is it. This is, you, you all are going to... But the pro, what Joseph didn't understand was a process he had to go through to get there. It wasn't just because he was a special child. He had to go through some things before he got there. Now, fast forward, and his brethren came and fell down before his face, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. Why did they do that? Because Joseph was now in a position of authority, and they did not know. They thought their brother was long gone. They did not recognize his face. They didn't recognize little Joseph. And now they're starving, and they're, we need food, and we, we're starving, and all of our, our, our families, we need food. And Joseph is in the position to give them food. So now they fall down on their face, and they say, we are your servants. Joseph said unto them, fear not, he says, for am I in the place of God? But watch what he said. But as for you, ye thought evil against me. But God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people. Now, now watch very carefully here, okay? I'm going to give you this and then we're going to get right into the lesson. He said, you thought evil against me, but, but it was the will of God because God meant it for the good. What's missing there is the fact that somebody somewhere somehow had to help keep Joseph going. If it wasn't for the love of his father, if it wasn't for the special coat of many colors he was given, watch, if it wasn't for Joseph being made to feel encouraged, Joseph could very well have given up, lost hope, and then the will of God could never have been done. Somebody had to encourage him. Look at verse 21. Now therefore fear ye not, he says, I will nourish you. The encouragement that Joseph got helped him become a better person. Okay? And your little ones, and he comforted them and spake kindly unto them. Amen. Do you want Brother Lambert, read for me the focus verse, please. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. Very good. Brother Garrett, uh, focus thought, please. He was a child, an inch of encouragement, and he would take a mile of comfort. You give a child an inch of encouragement. He will take a mile of accomplishment. Okay? Now, let me tell you what I believe today. I believe that parents should be their children's biggest fans. I believe that parents should be the greatest source of human strength to their children. And I believe that they should be the strongest encouragers. Nobody can better persuade them of their worth and of their value as individuals than their parents. But also, nobody 
can tear down the self-esteem of a child quicker than their parents. Yes. Now, in this article titled Developing Your Child's Self-Esteem, the website uh, Kids Health offers the following. Healthy self-esteem is like a child's armor against the challenges of the world. Kids who know their strengths and weaknesses and feel good about themselves seem to have an easier time handling conflicts and resisting negative pressures. In contrast, kids with low self-esteem can find challenges to be sources of major anxiety and frustration. Those who think poorly of themselves have a hard time finding solutions to problems. Parents and caregivers can promote healthy self-esteem by showing encouragement and enjoyment in many areas. Avoid focusing on one specific area, for example, success on a spelling test, which can lead to kids feeling that they're only as valuable as their test scores. Right. Now, the, the article goes on to identify seven tips to help foster healthy self-esteem as a child, okay? And listen very carefully. Be careful what you say. Be a positive role model. Identify and redirect inaccurate beliefs. Be spontaneous and affectionate. Give positive, accurate feedback. Create a safe, loving home environment, and that's a big one, and help kids become involved in constructive experiences. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 1 reminds us of the importance of having our own cheering section of encouragement as we move forward in life. And I believe that that too is what parents can provide. Now, let me just say this from the very, from the very onset. And, and I'll tell you, I'm not giving this to you because I didn't give it to me, okay? From the onset, from the very beginning, the reason why a lot of parents don't encourage their children like they should is because they probably did not receive it themselves. Now, how many times have you said as a parent, well, they're going to want to learn to get along in life just the way I did, the school of hard knocks. Come on now. Now, you may not have said those exact words, but you probably thought, well, you know what? I'm not going to, yeah, I'm going to encourage them, but I'm not going to, you know, baby, baby, leave me because I want my kids to survive in this world. Let me tell you what makes a child survive in this world, okay? It's not babying and pacifying them, okay? But it's also, it's also not beating them down and just kicking them out into the wild either. You want your child to survive in this world, here's what you're going to do. You're going to teach, you're going to train, you're going to love, and you're going to encourage. I'm telling you, you can say whatever you want to die as much as you want to. It's between you and God. But I'm going to tell you something. I find times where I have to force myself to say a word of encouragement, not all the time, but in certain situations, because I look back and I go, well, you know what? My father didn't give it to me at that specific time or in that specific situation. I didn't get it from my dad, and look how I turned out. And then it's like somebody hits me in the back of the head and goes, you dummy, look how you turned out. <laughs> You're not perfect. You struggle in this area. You have an insecurity in this area. Maybe if that encouragement was more, right. maybe if that encouragement was stronger, maybe if it was there when it should have been, maybe I would be better at that area in my life. Right. And so parents wrestle with this. And if there's anyone of the human family that needs encouragement, it is children. I mean, folks, let's think about what children are. I mean, look at it. Children, do you realize that children... From the time they're born till the time that they become of, of the age of accountability and even on further in life, children will, will very easily pattern themselves, themselves after what they see in the home. Right. Right. So it is the training mode of children. If you're always on your child, that child is going to grow up with this feeling, my Lord, I can't do nothing. I can't be creative. I can't do... I'm not saying you need to let your children color your walls with crayons because they're learning to be an artist. 
Oh, look how sweet. He spray painted our new car. But isn't he such an artist? That's not encouragement, folks. That's sheer stupidity. Don't, that's not what I'm saying here, okay? But you have to understand that parents are usually the people that are closest to the children the majority of their early life. And it is paramount for parents to be encouraged. The Lord has given this role to parents to encourage their children, and by all means, they never should be a source of discouragement to them. Facing a brand new world in which they live, you need to understand this. You've been in this 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years. You've been at this. But a child feels like an alien. They're learning what to do. They're trying to sort out feelings. Okay? And you all know me by now. I'm not Mr. You know, Fuzzy Bear and think it's all about people's feelings and all that. But listen, children have feelings. Yes, yes they do. And by nature, children are automatically emotional creatures. Automatically. From the time they're a child, they come out of their mother's womb crying. For goodness sake. Okay? They learn how to cry. They learn how to laugh. There is no listen, when a parent, when a parent that's worth its salt hears a child cry, it breaks their heart. When the first time that they see the little infant crack a smile and laugh, isn't it the greatest feeling you've ever had in your life? And then that, nowadays, you know, you get out the cell phone and you and you, and you you do whatever it is that you did. You make what ignorant face that you just made. You stand on your head. You do whatever to go. <laughs> you know, I love to see the, the reverse of that camera sometimes. When that about you know that kid's cooing and laughing and everybody's looking at it. There needs to be a candle on that parent to see what they're doing. <laughs> Things in their ears and, you know, acting like we would never act. We're going out of our way because that child laughing is just, it's making our heart explode. Right. Right. So the child laughing, the child crying, the first time that the child gets angry, the first time that the child, you know, you know, we, we get that sense of, Oh, you know what's going on? It's because they're trying to, to feel out their, their emotions. And every day, children face brand new challenges. And these challenges can create a feeling of inadequacy and a feeling of fear in every child. And it is the parents or the guardians, even if it's grandparents raising their, grand, their grandchildren, we saw somebody the other day out at the, uh, at, at the yard sale. With some lady came out, and my wife knew her, and she's, you know, was talking about her kids being grown. She had her granddaughter with her, and, and she made the statement of how now, now this grandchild has now moved into the home. And now here she's having to raise this grandchild, you know. Then it happens, and it's, it's wonderful. Thank God that there's parents and grandparents and family that can raise these children. Thank God. That they're not just shipped off somewhere. Somebody that really doesn't care about them. You know, raise them. So, parents or, or grandparents or family who is well positioned to effectively guide them through what, what I consider minefields of change. I mean, that's what it is. These children don't know. My boys don't know where to step next. They don't know. They may step in a direction next and, and that mine go off. And, and, and totally change their lives forever. So somebody has to be there to encourage them. Children need to feel accepted. They need to feel love. They need to feel uh, uh, approval. And these emotions combine to form this necessary catalyst of development for every single child. All individuals not firmly established in the role of their identity need to accept and love to help them to find out their identity. I want my children to find out who they are. There are so many traits of my children. There's traits of, of Connor that are just like me. And then there's traits that he has that's just like his mother. Colin, there's so many characteristics of Colin that are just like his mother. And there's a few like me. And it's so funny. <laughs> It is. It's like she's got her mini-me, and I've got my mini-me. It's crazy oftentimes how, but, but, you know, when you look at it, it's like, wow, this is really cool because, you know, I can see myself. But you know what's funny is that when they're good, when they're talented, when they're creative, that's when it's you, 
You know, yeah. but when they're bad, that's when they're their mother. <laughs> that's when they're their father, you know. Oh, he's my little precious boy. Look how awesome he is. And then when they're tearing up Jack, stop acting like your mother. <laughs> You're just like your father. <laughs> so we have to understand that every child needs to feel that acceptance. When they're good, I accept them as my children. And when they're bad, I accept them as my children. Amen. Children need to feel unconditional acceptance. Unconditional. I'm only going to love you if you're good. Your child better never feel that way. Amen. Yeah, listen, there is a problem. When your child comes in the first time that you erupt on your child, don't act like you know. But the first time you erupt on your child, that child comes in and that child feels like you don't love them anymore, there's a problem. And you better deal with that right away. The first time it happens, you have to deal with that. Because if you don't, well, I'll tell you, I will, I will love you if you'll act good. You don't tell your child that. You have to love them no matter what. Children are very sensitive. Very sensitive to the emotions of acceptance and rejection. You know, you know what other animal? You know, there's dogs can feel when they're accepted or rejected. Right. I mean, think about it. A dog knows when you're ready to love on it. You're accepting it. A dog also knows when you're ready to get off to it. Dogs feel that. Cats could care less because they don't have a soul anyway. <laughs> Cats do their own thing. It doesn't matter. Isn't that right? Man. All you cat lovers. <laughs> but the truth is, is that children feel the emotions of their parents. Children know what's happening. Only unconditional acceptance creates confidence in a child. A child can feel confident to know that when I messed up, when I made this mistake, I know I'm in trouble, but I know my mom and dad still love me. I know they're going to punish me for what I did. Oh, and it's going to be bad. But I know that they still love me. Every time, and, my, and Sister Murray can, can attest to this, every single time we've ever gotten on to our boys, which is sometimes, every time we get on to them, every time there's something that they do, yeah, every day, every time that there's something that happens, no matter how big the blow up is, no matter how much drama that is, no matter how long and drawn out the soap opera is, the truth is, at the end of it all, we always come back. And I'll set them down, or if they're in their bed, I'll get down on my knees by their bed, and I'll say, do you know that mommy and dad love you, don't you? And they say, uh-huh. Never one time have they ever said, well, I don't know. They've never done that. They know because we told them how much we love them. Right. And, I, and listen, you'll make mistakes as parents. We make mistakes as parents. Everybody makes mistakes as parents. Well, one thing that there'll never be a mistake on is that they know that we love them. We're not going to make that mistake. So, unconditional love de uh, demands no prerequisites. True love keeps on loving regardless of the circumstances, regardless of the situation. Conditional love contains a price tag. It always does. Conditional love always contains a price tag. It suggests that if a person acts in a particular way or does a specific thing, that someone will not love that person. And that love is very cheap and that love is very shallow. I want my children to feel worthy in the sight of God. I want them, when they come to church, I want them to feel like they're something. When they go home, I want them to feel like they're something. If the only time, and this is where, I, this is where we all as parents need work. If the only time we ever encourage our kids is when they do something really good, then again, they'll only judge their worth by that certain thing. We have one son that's, that's, that's a great reader. He's fantastic at reading, fantastic in spelling. We have another one that's that's very good at math. He does a, a much better job in math than the other. We never make a difference between the two. But I also don't want to, you know, I don't want to go when when the one that's not great at math 
when he gets a, a, a math question right, I want to praise. I, oh, that is fantastic. Amen. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, he may not excel in everything in life, but, you know, in every uh, uh, category of life, but I want him to feel good about the things that he does. Right. And if he doesn't do it right or doesn't do it good, you have to say, you know what? That's okay. You'll get it next time. I, I was so, this is where I went back to my childhood because I don't remember my dad ever teaching me how to ride a bike. I don't remember my dad spending, really didn't spend time with me doing those things. And I'm teaching, you know, Colin jumps on the bike and psh, takes off. And man, I don't know, he's a piece of cake. I don't have to, Connor jumps on the bike and it's different. He's, he's not as coordinated and, you know, he still needs the training wheels and, and so, you know, I was trying to teach him how to ride the bike, and, and as long as my head was touching that handlebar, touching that seat, you know, he was fine. But the moment I let go, it's like he just went, you know, just lay down. And I couldn't understand that. I was like, what? Connor, you can do this. And I found myself, Sister Johnson, getting frustrated. I never said it, but I wanted to say, you know, look how your brother did it. Just do it the same way. I never said that, but I wanted to. And I was, you know, trying to agree, and I found myself getting frustrated. And he looked up at me and said, Dad, I'm just not ready yet. That was hard for me. Because I, I was like, you can do this. I was trying to encourage him. And I found myself struggling with that. Because see, that's how my dad did. Did it? Do it? Get on it? Or not at all? You know, that's his thing. <laughs> and so, I, you know, with this whole struggle thing about encouraging, and so he kept encouraging, kept, you know, to, to date, he still can't do this without training wheels. But, and that's fine. That's fine. Mom, that's fine. But he can, he can sure, you know, we, we got on these little electric scooters and same thing. Colin got on that electric scooter and zip, same And Connor jumped on and he, first thing he did, he started wobbling and ran right into a fence. Bam! That was it. I'm done. I don't want the electric scooter. Well, just yesterday, I believe it was, yesterday, day before yesterday, uh, he finally learned how to ride the electric scooter. Man, I was like, woo! I was like, yeah! It's riding an electric scooter. Thanks, he's going to want to be driving the car. Yeah. Woo! And I'm going to be going, no, no, no. See, so these, these things happen. And you have to learn that no matter what you're going through, no matter what experience, this is where parents, and I'm speaking as one, this is where parents get it wrong a lot of times. It's because we use our past experiences as a model for what we're going to do on our children. And that's not right. Okay? No matter how much they're like me, they're not me. I don't want them to have a lot of the same experiences that I had because I want to try to shelter them from a lot of experiences that I had because yeah. according to the grace of God, I've been lost and dead and who knows where else. So it's okay, you know, to shelter your, your children in a lot of areas. But then there's a lot of life experiences that they're going to need. They need to feel like they belong. Acceptance and love create a feeling of belonging in children. They may not be old enough to understand. They may not be old enough to think of even what the words acceptance and belonging even mean. But listen, when they're, they're, they're old enough to understand the attachment of the feelings that go along with them. Well, I know what that feels like. I know what acceptance feels like. I know what rejection feels like. So connection to parents is what God intended when He planned the nuclear family. That was what He had in mind. The family connection creates the feeling of belonging that every child needs. When a child feels like they belong, there is a normalcy there. And I'm going to tell you what, that's where we struggle today. Because there's a lot of families today where life is just not normal. Amen. Right? I don't care how much you watch Leave it to Beaver when you were growing up. <laughs> It's not normally like that. That's right. No. Honey, I'm home. Well, supper's on the table. <laughs> For the life of me growing up, I never could figure out how that Beaver and Wally could have parents that awesome and they do some of the dumbest things as kids. <laughs> how can your mom look like she was on a magazine cover, always wearing an apron, something hot cooking all the time, Dad comes home from work and he's dressed to the nines, has a shiny car, and Beaver's out in the front 
courtyard, he's got his head stuck between the fence posts. You just want to walk up and say, you dumb kid, look at your life. But the truth of leave it to Beaver is, if anything's going to go wrong, leave it to Beaver. Right? And I know, but that's the way that Hollywood portrays family. Most family is not like that at all. Most family, you know, dad comes home from work, where's dinner? I don't know. I've been stressed out all day. <laughs> Kids aren't getting their heads stuck between the fence anymore. You know? They're doing other stuff. Worse stuff. And so, you know, whether it's a child, whether it's parents with, with their own children, birth children, or whether it's parents with adopted children, no matter, listen, adopted parents that have adopted children, you, that, that's what it takes a very special person to do that. And, and I pray for any parent that adopts, you know, children, if, no matter what circumstance in their life put them in that position, you got to think, they'll, they're going to come of age when they find out that they were adopted, however they figured out, and then they want to trace down and hunt down their birth parents. Right. And now the parent that is loved and cared and nurtured and given their life, now that parent, that parent or parents, now they're going through this whirlwind of, you know what? Now they want to feel accepted as parents now. Right. Now this child's going out, I want to find my birth, and that's fine. That's, I don't have any problem with that. But you think about the things they got to go through. They spend a life of encouraging, you know? What, what children, now listen to this. Parents, when you invest in your children, and this is something that, again, I told you, this is something that I had to preach it myself <laughs> concerning. Most of the time, what children talk about with their parents is just really not very interesting. I mean, it's not. Let's be real, okay? Sometimes it's not very interesting. And not my kids, hey, Dad, what, son? Uh, I mean, we could go through the conversations all the way. Dad, you, you know that thing when you're, you know, and, I, I'm, there and I'm going, yes, come on, spit it out, spit it out, and I have to catch myself. See, to me, to me, I've got, okay, hurry up, let's have this conversation because I've got things to do. I've got things. But to my child, this is what's interesting to them. And their eyes are beaming, and they're all lit up. And all they want me to do is care about what they're saying. That's it. And it is. It's work to go. Count to five. And then look at it and go, yeah. That's awesome. And half the time you feel like you're putting on, you know. I got a good friend of mine from Canada. We were talking. We were doing a camp together. And he said, you know, I finally figured out how to have an amazing relationship with my wife. And I was like, how's that? He said, no matter what I'm doing, he said, whenever she starts talking about something I'm not interested in, he said, all I need to do is go, you are kidding me. That is awesome. And he said, she goes about her merry way. He said, I found it. I found the jewel of great price. He said, I can be on my phone. He said, I can be texting up. My wife can be talking about something. See, I'm giving it up right now. My wife's looking at me like, I've got you now. I've got you. Sorry, sorry, fellas. But he said, I can be happy to go, you, what? That, babe, that's horrible. He said, then, then it just goes away. <laughs> See, this is the thing. Kids, we do that with kids. And we're, but kids understand when you're not just like women do. They understand when you're not focusing on what they're saying. No, hallelujah. Well, move around at all. Page two. So, th this is the thing. You have to focus, on, and I told you, I'm not preaching to myself here. We have to learn to start honing in on what they're saying because it's only for a few moments. Right. They're not going to take up your whole entire day about what they're talking about. They want to just talk about it and get it off their chest. And I know it's hard. Listen, it's hard to make some of these concessions as a parent. We, we went, went uh, looking for some clothes for, for our boys, and I've got, listen, Connor, you could dress him in a Snoopy outfit, and he doesn't care. He could care less. Colin, on the other hand, he is that one right over there. I'm telling you, he, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, yeah, he's my, he's my Here, Here's what happens. No, and I say that in the best way because I'm, 
I'm going to flip it around and show you how cool it is. <laughs> Connor had this outfit, you know, it had, it had boxes all over it. Pants, little bitty boxes all over it, you know. Cute. Colin, not interested. No, I don't want that. I'm not wearing that. He's seven. As a dad, I'm going, oh boy. I said, you know what's going to happen? You're going to wear it and you're going to like it. And my wife says, well, you know what? But here's the deal. Then I'm the one, as I'm pressing that's left to have to put up with this bad attitude, this whining and fussing. So in my mind, I'm trying to get this on. I'm swimming, you know. I think I just walked out of the store and said, I'm out. Whatever. <laughs> you know? But Colin, you know, that's the way he is. He's, he's so different. He, if it's going to be a blue coat, it needs to be a blue coat with brass buttons. <laughs> he said, okay. Now, but the watch, the watch. I could be for the Lambert. I could be, man, I'm telling you right now, you're going to wear it. Gonna... But, but, if I take from that child that feeling that he's kind of, that he's got a little hand in. You understand what I'm saying? Right. Listen, listen, Brother Perry, Paul Perry, was one of the most independent, focused, talented, driven men that I've ever met in all my life. Yes. You know who he was as a child? Colin James Crow. It's spooky, isn't it? My mother-in-law always says, she's I'm telling you right now, if that's not Paul Perry, there's not a child alive that's Paul Perry. He is just like that. Now, I don't know what happened. I'm, all I'm saying is, is that th those talents, those things, you have to draw the line. She can't say, well, Colin, you dress yourself now. You do whatever. Colin doesn't need that all the time. But at those times when he needs a little bit of guidance, give him guidance. But at the times where he can feel like that he has some accountability, some responsibility, folks, I'm going to tell you something. As a parent, I don't want to dull that tool that is being sharpened for creativity, I know, this sounds like old psycho babble, but it's not. It's completely true. When, when he feels like that he can have his, a, a hand in that, he thinks it's a great thing. When I'm working on something, he comes out there with a tool, I can let him turn a screw halfway, Brother Kevin, and he feels like that he has helped me build that whole thing just by turning that screw a half time. That's him. I want that to continue in his life. Right. I don't want him to be afraid of work or working hard at all. I want to try to help cultivate that. So I don't want, listen, you don't need to make your children miss because, you know what? I'm a parent. You can do it on your own when you get out of my house. I want you to think about this. Let's say they get out of the house at 18 years old. Well, whatever. These days it's 25, 26. Let's just say 18 or 20. Okay, then that's 20 years, listen parents, of you doing everything for them, and then you kick them out into the world and say, there, have a nice life. What have they learned? <laughs> nothing. Right. They've learned nothing. Because mommy's always fed them. Daddy's always done this for them. And mommy's always poured their milk. And mom no. You are robbing your child of excellence. You're stealing the excellence right out of their life because you're teaching them how to be mediocre at best. No creativity. I want my children to Even now, it makes me nervous. The other day we were grilling out and I was, we were grilling some, some asparagus. And my wife was standing right there with him, but she gave Colin a knife. Oh, Lord. And she had him cut the tips off that asparagus. And he was helping her cook and it was so, I mean, it was really cool because he was, and you know what? This child never eats vegetables. Can't stand them. But my wife, in her infinite wisdom, thought if she could get him involved in making them, that he would eat some. And he did eat some. Did he like it? I don't remember. No, but he ate them. Okay. Not even involved in making that so that he might be able to eat them. I had to go outside because as dad, here's what I saw. Chop, chop, chop. <laughs> blood, you know, the whole thing. Now I can't finish my, you know, meal because we gotta take the kid off. That's what I that's what I was thinking. But she was right there, she knew what she was doing. 
but it made him feel special. It made him feel like he was a part. And so children are going to make mistakes. They're going to make minor mistakes. They're going to make major mistakes. But here's what parents need to do. Parents need to correct their children properly. Now, I'm all about correcting your children. When a child needs a spanking, I believe that the child should get a spanking. But I am not for no teaching, no real correction emotionally and men mentally, and all you do is beat your child to death. You're not teaching them anything. Here's what you're teaching them. You're teaching your child to be afraid to do anything. Be afraid to venture out there. And I'm going to tell you something. you got to be all careful in public these days. Yeah. Well, I want people to know I correct my child. Right. Well, you know what? Tell that to Family Protective Services. Yeah. Yeah. When somebody that sees you from across the way uh -huh. decides to make a phone call. Right. Yeah. All right. I mean, you can say whatever you want. That stuff happens. Yeah. And once they're called, that's it. Yeah. It stays on them. Okay, so we have to be very careful. Discipline your children, but be smart about it. Right. Be smart about it. Every step forward that your child makes ought to be celebrated. Every step forward that your child takes ought to be celebrated as looked at no matter how small, no matter how incremental, they're baby steps. We know that they are, but it empowers them if you rejoice over these things. I want you to think about the tallest trees that you can imagine. Think about the redwood trees in, in Colorado, okay? Tall redwood trees. You think those things grew that big overnight? No. In fact, if somebody was living there among those trees in a building or in some kind of a little cabin or something. They can look at those trees and they can think, you know what? These trees aren't really growing at all. And you look out in your front yard and you watch a tree. How many just sit around and watch the tree grow? You can't do that very long. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be right here on this front porch until that tree's full grown. Well, I love that. While life passes you by. Children, it's the same way. Children grow up. Here's what happens. One day, you get up, and dad, and, and your, your, your child looks at you, and your child says, Dad, can I borrow the car keys? And Brother Kevin, you go, wait a minute, when did that happen? Yeah. Yeah. That's how it works. And then you look back, oh, they grow up so fast. But what's amazing is that as they're growing up, it doesn't feel very fast, does it? No. When they're going through these stages, you know, they go, everybody talks about terrible twos. We never had terrible twos. Ours were terrible threes and fours. That's what they were. When they hit four, something happened. It was just like, I don't know. I mean, it just, everything broke wild when they got four. And then it just seems like it's so drawn out. But then I look back now and I'm like, man, these boys are getting so big. So... As they grow, parents should remind their children that through just a little bit of progress, they can accomplish so much. It seemed like that when, whenever I did anything with my dad, that my dad wanted it like the way he wanted, the way he had it, because see, his dad was that way to him. And so it's like, you know, when I'm out there holding the flashlight for him underneath the hood of the car, it's like, see that? Put the flashlight right there. So I put the flashlight right there. Now, as any kid would do, my mind leaves, and I'm like, <laughs> Son, put the flashlight on the pool. And then Brother Hollingsworth, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay, okay, I'm going to help you. And then, and then my mind starts wandering, and start daydreaming, and then that light trips me. He'd back up. I can't do this. If you don't put the light where it's supposed to go. You know, we, we parents, we do that. We want it this way. We have to understand they're a child. When a butterfly comes out of its cocoon, it cannot have help. Some of you may not know this. When a butterfly comes out of its cocoon, nobody can help it. You can't reach in with a little sharp instrument, open it up, and take it up. You know why? Because when a butterfly comes out of its cocoon, it is literally, in that short span of time, it's exercising muscles and movements and tendons that will help it to fly. So if someone physically helped a butterfly out of a cocoon, 
and then held it up, it would never fly, ever. So coming out of the cocoon enables it to, uh, to exercise the muscles and the things that are necessary for it to finish in life. So you can help your child, but then there's some things in life where you have to let that child do it on its own. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I mean, I know it might be tough. I'm going to tell you right now, at some point, your children need to learn to do things on their own. They can't be getting ready for school at 15, 16 years of age and you're still tying your shoes for them. There's a problem. I don't care how cool Velcro is. They need to learn how to tie their shoes. So during this growth process, they need to feel that, that they do. They do have input in some of their own development. Yes, my child is going to be raised in church, but I want, I want my child to feel like that they have input in coming to church. That's why that we let them worship. They have input in the service. That's why I don't stop it. When I watch one of my boys go over and lay hands on one of you adults, and you may not even realize it, but just come over and lay hands on you and pray for you, I'm not going to go stop. <laughs> I want them to feel like they're a part. They're not disturbing. If they're beating you on the head, that's a different story. You know, if they're kicking you in the knee while you're praying, that's different. But when they're just, you know, praying for you, they're not bothering you and saying they're just, they're legitimately, you know, praying for you. I want them to have input in that. You need to let children feel like that they have some control because I'll tell you what, it takes away that frantic feeling of always being controlled. Well, I'm always in control of my child. Listen, nobody here likes to feel like they're being controlled 100% of the time. Not one of you. You like some of that independence. I, I want my children to feel some independence. I want them to know that dad is there, mom is there, we're leading, we're God and directing. But they also, they, they do have, you know, what do you want for breakfast this morning? This is what we have. A, B, C. Which do you want? We have a child that always wants D, E, and F. Yeah. It doesn't matter what ABC is. And I always said, but we don't have that. Well, that's what I'm, but we don't have that. We have this, this, and this. Of the three, which do you want? I want this. We've already had this discussion. We don't have that. But now they know, you know, if they're going to eat, they're going to eat ABC, right? Right. Yeah, that's the way it should be. So, at first the parent, you know, may have to, in working, may have to deny the child's request. At first, you know, the child may want to do something, you say, no, you can't do that right now. You can do this, you can help, let it, you know, you can be a part of this. But there's just some things, you know, I love when my boys get out there and Colin wants to, you know, he, he wants to toss the, what is that, the cornhole. Yesterday, he's wanting to toss the cornhole. And I was looking at him, I was like, He'll just go get in there. I mean, some of these bigger guys are going to want to play. One 15 minutes later, Brother Nate came in and said, Well, that's that. I said, What? He said, I played Colin and Corden only beat me. <laughs> I said, What? He goes, Yeah, first two throws went right in the hole. I went, Wow. <laughs> so you can bring that up to Brother Nate later. <laughs> but, you know, so it, it's cool. So be, be good with your children. You know, discipline, love them, encourage them. Encourage your children. I want to encourage my children in the Lord. I want my children to know that they can come to the house of God and they can worship. Nobody's going to make fun of them. Amen? Nobody's going to put them down. Because good parents, and this is why I said that you can do this. You know what? If your children are out of your home, you can still encourage your children. You can still call your child up and say, hey, I just want to tell you that I love you, I think you're great, and I'm praying for you. And I don't care if your child is 30, 40, 50 years of age, you can still call your children and encourage them. That's why I said from the beginning of this lesson, you don't have to just do it when they're in your home. When they're out of your home, you can still encourage them. The encouragement from a parent, the love from a parent, can bring them back to God after all those years. One thing about my mom, one thing about my dad, they always encourage me. No matter what I did, they always encourage me. Amen. God bless you.